You are joining us for day three of our themed week, which we are calling Surviving in the New Economy. And this week has been the brainchild of my guest all this week, uh, Chairman of the Elite Investor Club, Graham Rowan, who is joining me uh, throughout the week on Zoom. And Graham, um, we always love to have your input on property tribes because you always have such a different way of looking at things. And I think it's so important for everybody, uh, including landlords and property investors, to uh, really start um, thinking about the longer term impacts of what going on. Because, you know, as, we, as we've said throughout the week, nobody is going to be unaffected by what's happening. And people can't kind of bury their head in the sand and think it's all going to return back to normal because it's not. Now, obviously, um, you know, what happens in America is, uh, you know, it does impact what's happening um, here in the UK. And you have titled um, this episode, uh, The Federal Reserve is Killing Capitalism. Now, what do you mean by that, Graham? <laughs> well, I mean, you just couldn't make up what's going on over there, you know. I mean, uh, obviously, we've talked about some of the other things about genies being let out of bottles with uh, lockdown and things. But if you look at the financial things that are going on, which most people, I think, you know, will not be aware of. You don't read about this in the papers. You don't see it on the news at 10, you know. But let me just explain one scenario that's been going on. So way back in August of last year, months before there was any talk about the Wuhan flu, there was a meeting of the G7 finance ministers in America. Um, and they agreed then a, a new kind of plan. We didn't even know that there was a financial crisis going on, but there was suddenly hundreds of billions of pounds being issued, or dollars being issued by the Fed into what's called the repo market, which is sort of short-term overnight loans to countries and, and big companies. And at that meeting back in August, they agreed that the next stage of their meddling in the economy was going to be to go direct, which in other words means instead of the Federal Reserve simply buying government bonds and using that as a way of covering the government's expenditure, they were actually going to go into the financial markets, they were going to buy corporate bonds from big companies, and even things like exchange-traded funds, ETFs, that you or I might buy on the stock market. So suddenly, the central bank made, I think, uh, four, the government made $425 billion available. The Fed then used reserve banking to turn that into $4.25 trillion. And then they gave a load of it to their chums at BlackRock and said, you go out and buy some corporate bonds with this. Oh, and yeah, buy some of your own ETFs. So some of the high risk, high yield exchange traded funds run by BlackRock, they were given money to go and buy their own funds. So, you know, if you or I did that, we'd go to jail. It would be called insider trading. You know, talk about conflict of interest. This is happening in 2020 America. It's absolutely incredible. So what you end up with is this in massive distortion of the financial markets. And the way these markets normally work is through, through a mechanism called price discovery, which is broadly kind of supply and demand. And you know, think about if you were going to buy a car or a house, you do a little bit of research into comparables. And you would know within two or three percent what you were prepared to pay for that car or that house. But if you've got this kind of distortion going on, how do you suddenly decide on the fair price of that Toyota corporate bond or, or that BlackRock ETF? Because it's been artificially manipulated by funny money. So you, you can't discover the price. You can't discover the fair value of it. So what on earth do you do from an investment point of view? So that is what is going on in 2020 America, with the Federal Reserve and BlackRock. And most people don't know it. And it is incredible. It gives capitalism a bad name. It is what I call crony capitalism. It is distorting the market. And what it will do is end up benefiting the ones that are already wealthy. Because only, I think, something like 85% of the American stock market is owned by 10% of people. And what this does is it gives more money to them and it broadens the gap between the rich and poor. 
which is already back to 1920s levels. And it's no wonder we're getting riots in the streets when that kind of thing happens and is now continuing and is being turbocharged by the actions around COVID-19. Well, that's really interesting, Graham. And I, I actually don't profess to understand um, all the different mechanisms um, that you've been describing. And, you know, how, how does that impact uh, a landlord such as myself um, or any of the other 2.5 million landlords in the UK? Why, why should we be concerned about that? I think that the, ultimately the concern is where we're going in terms of things like uh, interest rates and price inflation. And, and the more, certainly theoretically, the more money like this you print, the more inflationary it should be. Now, in the past, it hasn't always been the case because the banks were in a terrible mess around the time of the 2008 crisis. And when all this money got printed, they didn't put it into circulation in the real economy. They just used it to really rebuild their own balance sheets in a terrible state. Now, this time around, um, we've all been saving a lot of money during the lockdown. We've not been going out. We've not been spending. Um, so there's a lot of kind of pent up demand there. The bank's balance sheets are in much better shape, so they don't need to use the funny money to repair their own balance sheets. So it looks like it'll probably end up being more inflationary. Um, and that could actually end up being good for property owners because you know inflation tends to help increase asset prices. So in the same way as um, you know, uh, you, you'll see the price of gold going up at the moment. I think it's just hit $1,800 today. Um, that's a sign that perhaps you know, there's some inflation going. Um, I can look back, I'm old enough to remember the 1970s. You know, my parents bought a house up in northeast England for about £5,000 in 1971, and they sold it in 1973 for £10,000. It, it doubled in value in two years, 50% per annum inflation on house prices. So on one hand, obviously, that's, that's good, if, especially if you're a seller. But if you want to buy something else, you've obviously got to pay more for that anyway. So it becomes a bit of a paper profit. But um, so, so one impact of all this could be inflation. Um, but also, you know, who knows where this is going to end? It could be, a, a, there could be another financial crisis brought on just by the weight of all this government debt. Because what they're doing, and you've talked about the recent budget and some of the tax cuts in VAT and stamp duty and so on. Um, what the government's doing is deliberately reducing its own income at the same time as giving all this money away in bounce back loans, civil loans, uh, furlough payments, etc. So their, their own profit and loss account this year is going to look terrible because they've got a lot less tax coming in, a lot more money going out. So how are they going to deal with that? Are they going to introduce new wealth taxes on property to cover it? Are they going to introduce uh, you know, new kinds of uh, uh, you know, or lots of benefits like pension relief? So at some point, that pendulum has to swing from giving it all away to where we're we going to claw it back. And it's possible that you know, property owners could benefit if there's inflation, but they could suffer if there's wealth taxes. And I saw wealth being defined as 750,000. Well, you wouldn't need all that big of a buy-to-let portfolio to qualify as wealthy um, on that measure. So, you know, we need to be worried about what they're going to do to claw this money back. And also just where's the financial system going when we're seeing such uh, incredible things happening in America that technically would be illegal and they're twisting the rules by using their chums at BlackRock to buy all these direct assets. Um, yeah, you know, these are unprecedented times. We don't know how it's going to end, but boy, there's going to be some kind of impact from all this. Mm. No, I 100% I agree. And what I found so scary, Graham, you, you mentioned um, the bounce back loans. Um, from what I've seen across the forums and Facebook groups, they were being given out like smarties. You tick seven box, boxes and the money was in your bank account within 48 hours. And, um, you know, so much low cost money has been given out by the government um, some of it has indeed come into the pro property sector. Uh, I fear that it could be used, um, you know, erroneously for things that it was never intended for. Um, but ultimately, you know, some 
people have had a real um, bonanza out of this. Um, and it, it, it kind of doesn't always sit right with me when, you know, we, we know that industries are being decimated, livelihoods are being lost, people are, are dying. Um, there's, there's always going to be some people that, that uh, you know, take advantage of these situations. Um, but I, I think it's still dangerous ground to be on because when the government gives, uh, as you say, very often further down the line, it starts to do audits or compliance checks uh, and clawbacks. Um, and, you know, we, we need to be prudent uh, when we're accessing such things as uh, bounce back loans or, you know, defer mortgage deferments, etc. Because at the end of the day, they aren't going to be uh, free money. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, uh, bounce back loans in particular are being used like a, a free credit card. And, and so, you know, there's a year before you have to repay them and so on. So. We talked earlier on about how the real impact of COVID-19 won't be apparent for 12, 18, 24 months. Well, what better example than the bounce back loans? You know, there'll be so many companies that can't repay those. And what's HMRC going to do? Is the company going to be forced into administration? What will that do for unemployment, etc.? cetera? Uh, another group that were, you know, struggled with all this, that the self-employed took a long time to get any payments through but also company directors who primarily follow their accountants' advice and pay themselves in dividends. Um, the chancellor said, well, I can't distinguish business dividends from Marks and Spencer dividends. Therefore, I'm not going to uh, account for those in how you can you know, borrow money. So company directors, uh, including perhaps directors of property companies, have had a tough time. You know, they've been one of the losers in all this. But some of the other uh, people who've taken these bounce back loans how many of those are not going to get repaid and, and what will the consequences of that be? So in a way, you know, th this is what people call moral hazard. You know, you're, you're, you're creating something that could actually really cause a problem down the road. And politicians are very good at kicking things down the road. Um, but what will the fallout be from that? How many uh, companies will go under because they can't handle the repayments? How many people on furlough are actually going to not have a job to go back to. You know, the scheme's great initially. We've now been told it's ending in October. So companies who have a 12-week redundancy consultation process will now start to be thinking, okay, August, September, October, I need to begin that now. And so, you know, how many people who thought they were just having a bit of a free holiday are suddenly going to have to come to terms with the fact there's no job to go back to? And you know, they'll start, as you say, start claiming credit, etc. So, yeah, the, 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 the fallout from this is going to be immense. Um, and, and it's at the moment, I think, uh, impossible to predict. Uh, but, you know, you have to assume you're going to end up with a lot of failed companies and a lot of unemployed people. No, I agree. Um, my personal strategy for all of this is I have not taken any mortgage deferment holidays. Uh, I have not taken um, any government support measures at all because, um, well, first of all, fortunately, I, I've only had one non-paying tenant, um, which is, is, a, is, you know, very good for me. I was expecting perhaps worse than that, but it, it, it's actually worked out fairly reasonably in terms of my own portfolio. But I recognise that these, all these measures were uh, expressly for businesses that had been adversely affected by COVID-19. Those are the actual words in the bounce back loan um, information on the British Business Bank. Now, um, when you take one of these loans, you are actually signaling that your business model was weak, in my opinion, or if you take a mortgage deferment payment, um, every landlord should have cash reserves to be able to last at least a couple of months if they have non-paying tenants. So I think we're going to see that some people that have taken these government measures, when they go to apply for new uh, finance, this is going to come into lender underwriting. And in fact, we're already seeing evidence that it is. Um, and that some lenders are declining to lend to anybody that's had a bounce back loan, a mortgage deferment holiday, or any other government support, because they believe that that 
you know, and it makes sense to me that it indicates a weak business model. So some people that rushed into things during this uh, crisis um, and made these knee-jerk decisions to take free money or deferment payments, even if they didn't need them, they may find that this comes back to bite in terms of trying to grow their businesses because they can't access finance anymore. Well, yes, that's right. And, and of course, the, the, um, the other side of this coin is how will HMRC react if there were any issues with repaying? Because um, you know, they've been very strong in the past on these measures. Uh, I'm, I'm reading that they're going to be uh, really looking out for either claims, for example, furloughing of staff that were not justified or civils or bounce back loans. And if you think about some of the things they've been doing around things like the loan charge, where they've re retrospectively gone back 20 years to try and roll back tax, they're not gonna have any qualms about going back to companies saying, you shouldn't have claimed this, or you, you know, this is an erroneous claim, or you've not used the money properly. So again, there'll be pressure on those businesses to, to either spend lots of time trying to defend that and respond to it, um, or it'll just be the final straw that knocks them over as well. So again, there'll be unintended consequences down the line, but. What you're hinting at there, and I think that, that, that brings me up to a slightly broader topic, which is that one of the challenges now is we live in a digital age where we leave such a footprint of everything we've done that the data available to a lender or a credit agency or anything else is, is more than ever before. And they can look at your social media and they can look at your company's house, they can look at your bounce back loans, and then put all of that into their algorithm to form a view on whether they'll do business with you. And, and there's a similar potential thing happening in the financial world and in the currency world, which I'm really terrified about. Um, some people have been talking for some time now about there being a war on cash and that, you know, really the government would like to get rid of cash and have everything done with cards and so on. What they're now looking at uh, and, you know, we've all heard of cryptocurrencies and, you know, have a view on Bitcoin and all the rest of it. And in many ways, Bitcoin is seen as almost like a, a libertarian concept that gets us away from financial institutions and banks and governments. What's happening now is governments are thinking of doing their own digital currencies. And no surprise to learn that in the forefront of this is China with a digital yuan. Now, imagine at the moment, if you, in Beijing, if you don't pay your council tax, your, your face appears on a big screen as a bad citizen, and they limit your travel to the extent of even confiscating your passport. Imagine if they've also got control of your bank account and your money, and they can switch off your digital yuan so you don't even have access to that. And, and you know, that kind of power in the government's hands, that kind of knowledge of everything you have, everything you spend, everywhere you go, is quite scary too. So, you know, the, the, this digitization of our world and our life and our economy is going to have lots of impacts, and that's just one of them. Harder to get loans and mortgages because you dare to take this free money from the government, we're going to form a view, and our algorithm is going to say, for you, computer says no. No, well, it's absolutely fascinating, Graham. Um, we're going to talk more on this topic as the week continues. But for now, we finished our third instalment. Um, and tomorrow, uh, we are going to be looking much more at the property sector specifically. And we're going to be looking at structural changes to the property market. Um, so very much looking forward to our next instalment. But for now, um, Graham, thank you very much for your insight. Uh, thanks to everybody for watching and please do join myself and Graham tomorrow where we will be talking about uh, structural changes in the property market. Um, I'm going to be raising a few points about uh, holiday lets which I'll be interested to hear Graham's views on. So um, please do join us tomorrow as our themed week surviving in the new economy continues. <laughs>